Hello, everybody. I'm sat here with Adam Levine from 330.ai, who is behind the Pixelmind.ai image uh, generation service, which is now available in beta. Um, I've got some questions from the Riku community and some questions that I wanted to ask myself to Adam about image AI and, you know, geeking out on all of this stuff. But I thought, let's, let's give Adam the chance to introduce himself to everyone. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on, Stuart. Um, so I got my start sort of in disruptive technology about probably 13 years ago. Um, I was initially interested, uh, you know, in kind of drones like quadrocopters and that type of thing, which kind of reinvented at a fundamental level how flight could happen. Uh, you know, with additive manufacturing, my background before getting into disruptive technology was in traditional manufacturing uh, and just like the the incredible changes that are there. And then also in cryptocurrency, uh, which represented a disruptive innovation in the world of money, which I was very interested in, particularly at the time. Um, out of all of those interests, the only one of them that wasn't stopped uh, for years, actually, uh, by patents and by existing intellectual property that locked up progress and kept things from moving forward was, in fact, Bitcoin. So this led me down a rabbit hole first to understand Bitcoin very deeply, starting a series of podcasts, including uh, a fifth one back in 2013 called Let's Talk Bitcoin that became very popular and systemically important to the space for a while. That then sort of provided a launch pad for me to then help many other podcasts get started with the creation of a podcast network called the LTB Network. Uh, and then as part of launching that network, I also started doing some of the earliest tokenization experiments that use tokens and use blockchains for non-currency uses at scale and in real situations. So we built many of the first token control access systems, many of the first, um, many of the first uh, uh, rewards program systems, and we executed that with a community of several tens of thousands of people uh, over the course of about three years. As part of that, <laughs> uh, I was so early that no infrastructure existed to support my use cases. So I started a company called Tokenly, um, which built those, which built tools necessary to do the things that I wanted to do. And then that led me down a series of rabbit holes to until somewhat recently, uh, when I discovered, um, probably over the course of the last couple of years, sort of the increasing coherency and usefulness of AI first with text AI. And then more recently, uh, after January of 2021 with image generating AI. Mm -hmm. Um, so that then led me to first incubate, uh, 330 AI, uh, the company and pixel mine, the project within my company Tokenly, and then to spin that off earlier this year with the launch of the Pixelmind platform uh, into its own entity. So that's kind of the quick, uh, quick and dirty history for me. From a philosophical standpoint, I'll just say that the reasons why I really like disruptive technologies is because there's so many limits in our world, and there are so many things that are impossible. And when you look at disruptive technologies, one of the things that characterizes them is that they disrupt the way that things are by introducing new and better options, which typically open up services and opportunities to people who, tip, who would not have had them in the existing paradigm. And competition in particular forces improvement, because why would you use an inferior system if you have an option to use a superior system? This is one of the reasons why Bitcoin winds up being so important to me, because I think currency uh, competition is one of the most important things that we lack in our world today in any sort of meaningful sense. And Bitcoin represents a form of uncensorable money uh, that can't really, you know, be sort of uh, like legislated out of existence, much to the chagrin of traditional governments who now have to compete with an alternative for the first time in really yeah. their existence. So <laughs> that's my soapbox. What else can I tell you? <laughs> that's it's it's interesting because obviously I do see there's uh, some NFT links in Pixel Mine, and perhaps we'll we'll dig, dig into that in a little bit. Um, first of all, just sort of wondering your thoughts on image AI as it is now, because there's a ton of models going coming out. There's a ton of interest in the space. It's definitely something on fire and the models seem to be getting better and better, but there's always, there's always certain things that you can notice if you're looking for, you know, like arms might be deformed, especially hands. It always has a problem with hands. And uh, do you see this as something that could be fixed in the future or, what is the limitation sort of causing this? And, and secondly, to that point, with, uh, with these models, text is also often an issue, right? Because the text will come out deformed or it'll miss a character or similar sort of thing. So I guess going into the tokenization of how these models come about, how, how does that sort of look and how, um, how close are we to getting sort of flawless pictures, I guess? A lot closer than you think. Um... It's hard to appreciate 
how fast things are improving in image synthesis specifically. And I actually think we're going to get to a point probably early next year where image synthesis will just be a solved problem. And there won't be, I mean, there, there will be always continued optimizations and more models that will make things better. But I already think that with the existing models that we should have out, you know, within the next two months, that we are at a 1.0 you know, uh, type of release across sort of the image synthesis space where the quality is good enough that you can't tell that it's created by an AI and the, um, and the speed is fast enough that it doesn't matter in either of these cases. If you improve the image quality by 50%, it's better, but nobody cares because it was already good enough. If you improve image generation times from five seconds to two and a half seconds, that's great, but nobody cares because five seconds was already fast enough. So uh, what I'm actually really excited about, you know, we are focused on image synthesis right now, but I'm much more interested actually in the medium term in audio synthesis, in soundscape synthesis, mm -hmm. in movie synthesis, and all of these things that right now from a computational standpoint are not possible just again, like, or they're not practical, really, they're possible, but they're not practical. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as we get to this point, uh, as we get kind of past this point, they are. And let me go a little bit deeper on that. When I started this project, when I first discovered this technology, we were using a technology called VQGAN plus Clip. Mm -hmm. And VQGAN plus Clip can largely be thought of as a way to sort of transmogrify, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a surface into a different surface, but it has no awareness of what's going on in the image. It only can, I, I, I like to think of it like it takes little hooks and it sort of sticks them into the image and then it tugs it into what it thinks is the ideal configuration, but it doesn't understand what the images itself, which creates a lot of kind of challenges around that. So if you look at the quality of what we produce today, even without the new models that are going to increase things by another 100 or 200 percent in terms of quality, we are probably already a thousand percent better than we were less than a year ago. And the cost on it also has come down substantially. We do majesty diffusion in about 20 seconds when we have fast mode on, uh, as opposed to that old VQGAN type of technology, where it would take you know three or four minutes to generate a far uh, inferior quality image. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of that that's the thing to keep in mind is that over the year that I've been building this project, we have had four major technology releases, each one exponentially improving what is possible and not necessarily obsoleting the technologies that came before because they all perform what they do very well. If you want to, for example, one of the first series we did was we took an anatomical skull, a picture of it, and then we allowed people to use their words to change it into different materials using mm -hmm. VQGAN. And that's amazing. It's a, it's a gorgeous series uh, that you could not do with any of these newer technologies by nature of how they work. But if you wanted to create a coherent skull that you didn't start from a skull, then obviously these new technologies are much, much better. So it really, again, like there's this kind of Cambrian explosion that's going on in both the open source space, which is actually being in large part driven by inspiration that's coming from the closed source side of the ecosystem. And it's a dynamic that I see actually continuing to accelerate substantially. So when I first came to cryptocurrency, I saw this same type of growth curve, but it was significantly less <laughs> than I see right now in AI artwork. We're probably working at at least you know, twice the speed of what cryptocurrency was back in the 2012, 2013 era. And it might be significantly faster than that because you don't have to convince anybody that there's a problem with money, which was a big problem for cryptocurrency yeah. early on. You just have to convince people that it's cool to make, uh, you know, to make images or to make art with AI. And that's a pretty easy sell. Hmm. Yeah. I, I... I love some of the models that you have on on Pixelmind, some of the, like the cityscape, uh, city Northern Light one. I really enjoy playing with. Um, I'm here living out in Southeast Asia, and it was fun putting like Kaosan Road and Pat Pong Market and and some of like the 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 places over here in Bangkok and and seeing it produce pretty flawless outputs. So that was that was pretty uh, pretty incredible. Um, but I guess as more and more images do get created with AI and these different technologies, one of the questions that we get a lot and one of the most sort of requested question from the community was all about copyright, legal usage, all of that stuff. So is there a quick crash course on how that all works? What the hell is going on with in terms of who owns this, who owns, who owns what and how are the usage rights and is there likely to be any movement on that in the future or is it sort of your your sort of you get access to use it by the people who create the models but you're never going to get full rights or i i guess it's well, interesting to know your thoughts 
For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you can actually read our terms of service. They're linked to the sidebar of the Pixel Mind service and also linked during the checkout process. Um, in it, it basically describes the rights that you have as a member of Pixel Mind, which uh, include personal rights and then also actually co include commercial exploitation rights mm -hmm. for the images. So, uh, so 330 AI and Pixel Mind retain ownership. Uh, of the pieces, but you have the ability to use them. And the process of tokenization is actually the process of partially buying out uh, 330 AI from the copyright on it. Really, that's what we're using tokens for, is we're using them for copyright. So I have some plans and we have some things in development that I can't reveal here, which is which are the reasons why we are keeping copyright in this way. But we want you to be able to use the artwork that you create for really whatever. The one thing that we ask that you not do at this point and that you're not allowed to do according to terms of service is to mint yourself. Because yeah. again, we'll be using that for a copyright system and then for a larger system that we'll be revealing soon. So that's kind of how we deal with it internally more kind of broadly about AI mm -hmm. in general and about AI artwork in general, this is a totally unproven area. That's kind of where we are right now is that yeah. when I first started this project, I spent probably about eight hours on the phone with lawyers um, talking about copyright uh, with copyright lawyers and the, the, the uh, much cheaper version for your audience than what uh, I got uh, is that um, everybody is looking at sort of the current state of copyright as it relates to things other than AI created artwork. Um, and then they're implying what they believe will happen with AI created artwork as a result of this. So my assumption personally is that AI artwork will be recognized as the equivalent of using a paintbrush where it doesn't, that the, there's no consideration that the paintbrush has copyright to the thing that you've, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ability to protect it. It simply is a tool that you are deploying. And if you weren't deploying it, then it would have created nothing at all, right? Yeah. So whether you're talking about deploying it with code where you're doing programmatic stuff, or you're talking about deploying it in a situation like PixelMind, ultimately it shouldn't matter. This is a new tool that adds to sort of the artistic lexicon that people have available to them. And as a result of that, I see it really as very analogous to, you know, most of these other things. Now, some of the models and some of the ways that they were trained, we don't, we intentionally don't train models. We don't train, you know, new clip things because we do think that there's maybe some challenges in there. The mm -hmm. way that these models tend to work, like if you look at like how clip was trained, it actually doesn't, it was, it was, they scraped the internet for 450 million image and text pairs. And those were essentially an image and a caption that came along with it. And that was what they used to train it initially. Um, so there's some problematic stuff in doing that, but by the time it gets to us, all we have is a piece of software that has a, a statistical understanding of how certain word concepts relate to imagery concepts. So we never are in possession of anything like that. And that's true of anyone who's building one of these models, mm -hmm. unless you're doing what OpenAI has effectively done. So there are challenges. There's lots of sort of unproven ground still to be tested out here, but I'm pretty confident that we'll start seeing these things, you know, make their way through the legal system over the course of the next couple of years. Um, you know, and we will get some clarity. But in the meantime, there's this kind of period of sort of incredible creative potential to really do almost anything that you want before the regulatory apparatus catches up and the rules kind of get settled into place. And again, as a guy who really likes disruptive technologies, this is exactly where I like to be running kind of as fast yeah. as we can towards the gold rush. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's good fun for sure. Uh, I guess that leads nicely on to the next question, which, uh, which I've got is, are you seeing any sort of interesting use cases or ways that this technology has been deployed in in commercial ways already um by people using pixel mind or, or you know people within your network and how do you sort of see this technology um impacting the way that people work in the future one of the ways that i use it a lot at the moment is for um youtube thumbnails and for graphics for blog posts and stuff like that it's, it's really incredible it for, for i'll probably <laughs> i'll probably cancel my uh envato element subscription next year because there's there's no need for it if you can just create images on the fly but yeah interested to hear your thoughts on that yeah i uh one of my favorite pieces of album art that I created, because I still do tons of podcasts. I was a managing editor at Coindesk for a while, and now I still do a morning show for them. And then I recently just wound down my Let's Talk Bitcoin after nine years, uh, because I had to focus more on this. Um, but uh, one of my favorite uh, pieces of album art that I made earlier this year was uh, the 
chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, a picture of him testifying. And then I, I modified him with AI so that he was wearing clown makeup, but everything <laughs> else was entirely coherent. It was fucking beautiful. I loved it. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, no, the, uh, so like the obvious use cases are things like Alpamar, right? Like we've already seen people do that. We've already seen people, you know, just sell it as traditional artwork also. Um, so, I mean, like those are kind of the very one dimensional things, the mm -hmm. stuff that I'm really interested in. And again, they're like, we're doing stuff with NFTs, but we're doing stuff with NFTs because I can't not because there's some decent use cases here around <laughs> copyright ownership. But, yeah. but, uh, but for me, the real opportunities here lie actually in how do these, how does this change impact the real world, right? How does this change impact not the world of the internet, but the physical world where this is very, very kind of important and also not understood. So I'm spending my time on the phone with people from like porcelain manufacturing and printing companies, you know, like uh, wall decor companies, you know, like we're going like there's there's a whole variety of sort of real world tangible applications. But even just think about something as simple as a sticker that has unique artwork printed on it that has that then goes on to, you know, a, a red plastic party cup, right, that then mm -hmm. identifies that piece as your piece, even something like that can now be a one of one, right, you can have tile installations, for example, where every tile is actually unique, but fits within to a kind of established pattern. So again, like, all of these things that were just completely impractical, because the cost of creating the artwork on a one off basis made it so now that's entirely different. And that really does change a lot of things. And it's that change, whether you're talking about architectural firms being able to take a picture of something and then, you know, type in a couple of words and then envision sort of, you know, 10 different remodels that could happen. You know, like all of these things are going to happen. And it really is going to be about people who have those specific types of experiences within those industries who will say, aha, I can connect this dot to this dot and I can make something that's really important that would be much better. So Pixelmine aims to sort of be a back end provider for those types of use cases as well. And we're already working with a number of, uh, of companies kind of along those lines. So that's, uh, this is a, a blue ocean moment, if you're familiar with that, uh, that metaphor, basically, so like red ocean versus blue ocean. Uh, red ocean is a competitive environment where the market is already basically established. And uh, as a result of that, in order to gain market share, you have to take market share from one of the competitors. So it's a kind of necessarily uh, a bloody kind of process, mm -hmm. whereas a blue ocean is one that effectively has not yet been populated, right? So it's really, there's almost no downside to having competitors help open up the market because they're actually educating the audience that until then didn't know that they were the audience for it. So mm -hmm. it's an incredible time of opportunity. It'll probably last for maybe two years, but I wouldn't be surprised if this kind of if, if we saw a kind of saturation in terms of attempts across all of these industries within the next 18 months i think it's going to happen really really fast that's uh super interesting and it, like you said earlier it's just crazy how fast this space is developing and it has been shocking stuff coming me. out and doesn't seem to be slowing down at all um uh, no it's very much speeding up still yeah, and one of, one of the things that you notice with looking at the different companies, some of them are very close with their technology and their offering. Some of them are more open and some of them are taking more of like a community approach to, uh, you know, publishing all pro all the prompts, all the artwork, all of the, uh, the generations so everyone can see it. Where does Pixelmind sort of stand on this sort of approach? Are you sort of pro people playing and sharing, but also pro people doing their own thing and keeping their generations private or i mean that, that's basically it again like we don't want to dictate the correct way to do these things because different people have different needs from these types of solutions and our goal with pixel mind isn't to create the best model or isn't to you know find the the best anything it's to take the best technologies uh, whatever they may be, wherever they may come from, and make them available to people in a format that not only is easier to use and simplifies a lot of the complexity, but also which significantly gamifies it. We haven't rolled that part out yet, but I think that that will be sort of a turning point uh, mm -hmm. where people will start to really kind of grok uh, the, the, the thing that we're building here, but we're not talking about it yet. Now, as far as how the system actually works, we really do both things. So there are two parts, in, uh, there, significantly, there are two parts um, to the web version of the offering. We also have a Discord bot version of the offering, which we'll be rolling out uh, pretty soon. Um, and that one is 
most of it is public, although as far as the prompts go, although settings in the Discord bot are not public, settings are, are uh, only shown to the person who created. Now, within PixelMind, the web app, which is at beta.pixelmind.ai, um, mm -hmm. you can uh, go into series, and series are specifically tuned prompts, like the Aurora Borealis one yeah. that you mentioned, Stuart. So a user can go in and they can type in, you know, Tahiti. Uh, in the question of where is the aurora, you know, name a city, right? Um, and uh, and then it will create an image for that. And so in order to get to that, there's a ton of sort of proprietary tuning that has to go into it. And as a result of us doing those as series, we do keep those private. Now, on the uh, freeform creation side, we have a tool called the Imaginarium. And the Imaginarium allows you to simply toggle private or public uh, when you're creating. The reason why we like public is because pretty much everybody on the team, myself most of all, have learned how to do this very well at this point from watching what other people do and yeah. from iterating off of their prompts. And so I think there's a lot of value to that. But at the same time, we work with artists who very much value their privacy and who put a lot of work into creating things. So as it stands right now, that's it. In the future, we're actually going to be incentivizing pretty heavily people to release uh, their prompts, uh, uh, such and and reward them within our system, uh, among other things. So I think that most things will wind up being public, but I think that there probably will be a lot of things where it's like it's not public until the series has finished being produced yeah. and has closed, right? To give it kind of a timed yeah. exclusivity, but yes. still to open it up for learning. Yeah, I think uh, it's a similar approach to how we sort of do the text generation stuff in in Riku. You know, we we encourage people to share their prompts so other people can learn from them. But we understand that some people have specific needs and specific business use cases where they may want to keep some of the information that they put in that prompt private. So yeah. I, I, I totally get that. Um, and going back to how you mentioned different series and how you sort of fine tuned um, specific models, uh, fine tuning is, is pretty big in text generative AI and there's not really any way for the average Joe to do that on images at the moment. Is that an area that you see sort of coming and exploding? Because I've always thought, you know, if I could load up like a thousand of the best logos in the world and create a, you know, a, a, a text prompt to go along with those, you could probably get some interesting stuff for design, for graphics, for, for all of that. So is that something that could be coming in the future? Yeah, we're definitely interested in that. Again, like there's, so the, the challenge here is dealing with different types of users, right? Mm -hmm. You've got users who really have zero interest in learning anything, but are interested in sort of the novelty of the experience. Yeah. And if you can sort of present it to them in the right way, then you can kind of trigger that light bulb moment where they say, aha, this is actually not just a novelty, this is something that can be useful to me. So mm -hmm. that's what series are for. Series are to do that. They're to create the shortest distance between someone wanting to experiment for the novelty to discovering that they actually find something there. Mm -hmm. On the other side, you have users who want to do things like you're talking about, like fine tune a model, where you're basically further training a model, which is a very kind of intensive process. But the, the process of fine tuning a model compared to actually creating a model from scratch scratch is hugely easier. You know, you're talking about, you know, maybe one five hundredth of the of the time and resource commitment in order to do it. So it is very feasible. Now, I want to correct uh, something here, though. Mm -hmm. um, for the series that we do, we actually don't do fine tunes. We simply okay. uh, we simply use prompts and we we find things that we like and we dial them in. We've created a system that allows us to basically um, both insert controlled randomness to uh, so so uh, into prompts uh, to add additional style and things like that, and then also to control where user inputs go into a much more complex prompt. And really, that's what we've done is we've created a system that uh, effectively allows you to create art by filling in Mad Libs, and then by nature of that, you your your uh, you know your input your uh, contribution is combined together with something created by somebody who you know, really, really knows what they're doing. And as a result, that's how you get that consistency in the look yeah. across the series, yeah. but, but without actually doing any, any model training whatsoever. Surprising. Now we may actually start to do that in the future. We've been talking about it because we could get the series even better if we did do that. But, uh, but it hasn't been a priority to this point. It is something we are talking about though. And it is very much something that we would like to offer to our power users. Um, you know, who the types of people who 
you know, when we got Majesty Diffusion, Majesty Diffusion has like 150 variables in it. It's hugely complex. It has literally three different technologies in it um, compared to anything that we'd seen before, which was only a single technology and maybe max 30 variables. So that's the thing is like, when I look at the full set of variables, even I am like, I have no idea what I'm going to do with this. We have like two people on our team who understand the thing well enough to really be able to create amazing stuff. But when you do create amazing stuff, that's what all the style configurations are. If you're in Imaginarium, each one of those is a set of uh, a set of those 150 uh, settings that make the engine work in a very specific way to deliver very specific types of outcomes. So we expect there to be a lot more of those. And again, it's something where we'll be giving uh, access to power users, the ability to create their own, and then we'll actually be rewarding them uh, and giving them the ability to create their own series uh, using, uh, uh, you know, if they, you know, find these things and bring them in and want to kind of explore them with the rest of the community. So there's tons and tons of potential here. Uh, but again, there's the problem tends to be hours in the day, as you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just super exciting. You know, I, I always get my mind blown when I, when I talk with people like you, people involved in, the, in bringing these models, you know, making them more accessible to everyone. So it, it, it's incredible, really. I guess from, from a perspective and one of the questions that I always have um, as we try and sort of connect everything up at Riku is, is there going to be like an API offering that people can plug into to commercialize and add it to, to what they're doing? Um, one of the, like our, our long-term goals is obviously to try and aggregate, you know, we'd love to have Dali 2, Mid Journey, um, the Pixel Mind, uh, Majesty models, all in one place that so people could sort of see, compare, and contrast because they all offer something interesting and different. So, um, but it's uh, it's unfortunate that it's so hard to get API access to a lot of these at the moment. So, just wondering uh, what what your thoughts are on that. We're we're a pretty different company than most of the companies that are out there, right? Um, so uh, we built our API first. Our entire system is driven by API. We do have clients using our API. And if you'd like access, then we can definitely work out a deal around that. So yeah, I mean, again, like, you know, our goal is to connect dots here and make mm -hmm. stuff that's possible that isn't you know, that isn't currently possible and to help people to build tools that can bring these possibilities into the real world in ways that are really impactful and which I have no idea about, right? Like I'm not an architect, right? Like, we've heard from a lot of people about that. We've also heard from therapists, mm -hmm. um, you know, who want to use it in treatment and, you know, where we have a couple of pilot projects going on. So, I mean, like that's the that's kind of the beautiful part about this is that I don't know the right way to use it. I don't want to be the decider of it. All I want to do is make it easier for other people to use it and then to kind of combine all of those inputs together to make the best possible experience kind of for everybody. So I have too many ideas and I need people like you to take the API and to, and to build it into things that I don't have time to do. So yeah, let's definitely talk about that. Yeah, I guess you heard it here first. We'll be getting Pixel Mind and Riku at some point in the future, definitely. <laughs> So uh, that's been really helpful. It's been really fun to hear your thoughts on what's going on in the landscape and what you're up to. And I'm just excited for all of these models to continue to grow and continue blowing my mind. Um, I think we are out of questions here. So if you wanted to let us know, let the audience know where they can sort of find out more and maybe sign up for the beta if they want, um, feel free to plug. Sure. Yeah. Uh, beta.pixelmarn.ai is the place to go to sign up for the beta. Um, you'll notice that there's basically there's like a login button that says enter the mind minds. And then below that, there's a link that says, if you're new, click here. That'll take you to a Stripe checkout page and you can, uh, you know, Stuart, let me give you a discount code too. Um, how about we do a Riku, uh, R-I-K-U is a discount code and that'll give you 25% off the first month. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Perfect. Great. Yeah, will... Cool. So yeah, it, it's been great. Um, Look forward to the future and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Stuart. It's a pleasure. Cool.